So in the preceding two modules, we talked about the specifics of both the raster and the vector data model. And now I want to turn to talking about projections and how we're going to take data that are, that are on the surface of a sphere, on the surface of the Earth, and flatten them out in the way that we can systematically analyze them uh, with the GIS system. So the way we do this is by using coordinate systems. Uh, and we're all used to thinking about coordinate systems because this is essentially latitude and longitude and a few other coordinate systems as well. And it's really any system that represents points in two and three dimensional space. So we need this to be able to measure distance and area on maps. Um, and these are things that have been around for a really long time. And then we can sort of divide them up into two big categories. We have global coordinate systems, which work well for the entire world, um, but may introduce errors in particular locations. Um, and we have local coordinate systems that work really, really well for a particular spot on the world, but we can't do everything with them. We couldn't plot both data from Borneo and from South Bend, Indiana on the same map using, using a local coordinate system. So we have two main types as well. In addition to this, we have what we call geographic coordinate systems that are essentially working off of location on a sphere. Um, and we have projected coordinate systems, which have taken uh, some sort of systematic way of taking those spherical data and flattening them out so that we can work with them on a paper map. Now, if you've ever dealt with um, a deflated basketball or peeled an orange and tried to lay these things out, well, they don't lay out very well. So there's something that has to happen to, to convert spherical data, angular data, into something flat. Um, and we'll talk quite a bit about these projections in a little while here. But first, let's look a little bit at the geographic coordinate system. This is a global system. Um, it's, this is latitude and longitude. This is the coordinate system that we're all used to thinking about. Um, and it's essentially defined by the prime meridian and the equator are reference planes. And then latitude is the angles north and south from there, and longitude are the angles east and west. So it allows us to pinpoint our location on a sphere based on angles off of these reference planes. These angles are then measured in degrees, um, either in degrees, minutes, seconds, so something like 42 degrees, 32 minutes, 16 seconds um, north, um, or as decimal degrees, something like 45.3178 degrees north. Either one is, is the same data, converting back and forth between them is no problem whatsoever. It's just the decimal degrees tend to be a little bit easier for computers to deal with because it's not three numbers, it's just one number with a decimal after it. Um, so one thing that's important to remember with these geographic coordinate systems is that a degree is an angular measurement, it's not a linear measurement. So while a degree might be one length at the equator, um, particularly with longitude, um, it might be quite a bit different when we get up to the pole. It's going to be a lot smaller. Um, and that's just because the circle itself gets smaller um, as you sort of move away from those reference planes. So it can be quite variable, um, and it's always, always important to remember that these are not linear measurements. These are angular measurements. So this is what it tends to look like if we take a geographic coordinate system and sort of flatten it out. Um, the, the system we use to flatten it out is, is important. Um, and it's something that really does become one of two major complicating factors in doing digital mapping, in doing even regular standard cartography and creating paper maps. Um, and these two things are, are that it's very hard to map the surface of a sphere to a flat surface, um, and then the impacts of local variation. So just to address a little bit about the surface of a sphere and mapping this out onto a flat location, um, this is what we see. Um, I showed that map before. Um, and I didn't show that there's distortion in there, but there is. Um, and there always is when you take something spherical and try to flatten it out. It's impossible to maintain both shape and scale. Um, so both size and shape. Something's going to be distorted. Um, and we end up needing to choose the best, best method depending on the size and the nature of the map we're trying to create. And you can see an indication of this here in these, these things that are called Tissot's Indotrix, um, which are essentially circles of a standard size put on a globe and then when we flatten a map out in some way, you can see that they either get distorted or they get, the size gets different. So either the scale of them um, or the, the shape of them distorts as we flatten the map out. And this is because we're using something called a projection. So we're trying to project some part of the sphere onto a flat plane. And we can really only m maximize either our conformity, so the size of, or the shape of things, or equivalence, so the size of things. Um, we, we, we have to have a trade-off between these. 
And we're, we, we should, this should be familiar to everyone if you've ever looked at a, a globe, um, looked at Greenland on a globe versus looked at Greenland on a map. Um, generally, Greenland is either going to be a different size or shape because it's very far away from the equator if you look at it on a paper map versus on um, a, uh, um, a globe. Now, the way that we do this, the mathematical method that we use for projecting the spherical thing onto a flat plane um, can be kind of thought about as if we had a light in the middle of the globe. And then we're doing something, we're wrapping a piece of paper around, around the globe and then sketching, the tra tracing the, the, the outlines of continents or the outlines of any other geographic features onto that piece of paper. And there are three main types of these. There's what we call cylindrical present, um, uh, projections, or imagining it as if there's a, a cylinder of paper that's been sort of put around the equator, um, and then we're sort of sketching everything onto it from there. Um, a cone, uh, which might work really well for the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere, or a plane, where we're simply setting a piece of paper and then sketching what we see on there. So let's look at each one of these in just a little bit more detail. A cylindrical projection is one, one of the earliest and most common that we still see. Um, this is oftentimes these are called Mercator projections um, after one of the really famous ones that, that gets used quite a bit. Um, and you can see that here um, where we have essentially what happens is everything's very, very accurate at the equator. Um, and then it gets bigger or smaller as you're getting farther away because as you imagine the globe is sort of pushing this way. We can see more of that thing as we're trying to, 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 to sketch it um, and it ends up being a much, much larger um, geography than it really is. Um, and this is why you see Greenland is enormous. Antarctica looks like it's larger than every other continent put together. So this is one of the, the more famous Mercator cylindrical projections. Um, this is actually the projection that's used in Google Earth um, and Google Maps. Um, so it's really, really common in most web, web mapping um, uh, uses as well. We also have conic projections, um, which is essentially like wrapping a cone of paper around the Earth. Um, so it's going to work really well for either the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere or particular spots. Um, what ends up happening, because the cone is sort of curved, when we sketch on it things that would normally be a straight line, something like latitude, is going to actually end up being curved. So the size is going to be correct, closer to correct, but the, the scale of things is going to be a little bit different. Um, the, the shape of things is going to be a little bit different. So these tend to work quite well for um, parts of the world that um, are sort of on one hemisphere and kind of wide. Uh, so things like the continent of North America, the continent of Asia, um, these tend to be used quite, quite regularly here. Um, and we can use different methods for kind of maximizing what we're going to show in these different projections as well. So in this case we have a um, uh, what we call a, a, a Lambert um, projection of Europe. Uh, and this one is, is working to, to maintain conformity, so shape. We have ones that are working to maintain area, um, sort of somewhere in between. Um, and we have ones that are working to, to maintain um, distance as well. So there's some different ways that we can do these same projections even on the same, even using the same technique. The last one that we might encounter are planar projections, and this is essentially where you're just putting a piece of paper down on the globe and then sketching what you see. Um, and they tend to work really well for small areas. Um, most commonly, they're used either in state planes, so each state might have a way that it's going to map its particular um, area, um, or they're used for the poles, because the poles are almost never well represented in a plane or in a, in a flat map um, using any of the other projections. So it's really common that we'll see these for um, South Pole, or for the North Pole. Now there's one last type of projection that is, is really important and it's kind of a modified version of one of these. Um, this is what we call the Universal Transverse Mercator System or UTM. Um, and this is a type of cylindrical projection. It's a Mercator projection, cylindrical projection. But the other one that we saw was the paper was essentially touching at the equator. A UTM is actually transverse, so it's been turned and the paper is running between the poles. Um, so what this means is it's extremely accurate, it's very accurate for one little swath from the North Pole to the South Pole and then all the way back around. Um, so it's actually, this is a standard system that's used internationally. This is the most common sort of GIS based um, coordinate system that you'll run into. Um, and it's really important because it's only accurate for one little spot to think about this not so much as a universal system where it's one projection but as a series of 
60 different coordinate systems, each of which is really good for about a six degree swath of, of the world. They all fit together well, um, but it is important to remember what zone you're in. Um, for example, uh, here in Indiana, we're in zone 16 north. Um, New York would be zone 18 north. Um, and it's really easy to find maps. I'm going to show one in a second here that, that demonstrates what zone you're in in any part of the world. Now, the units in a UTM system are meters. Um, and they're essentially meters away from the equator, north of the equator, and sort of east, um, or yeah, east of the western edge of that zone. Um, so having a meter-based system is actually quite useful um, for some reasons we'll talk about in a little more detail in a second here. Um, but it overcomes some of that problem with degrees um, where it's not a linear measurement. Meters are a linear measurement. They're very, very useful for, for finding out distances. So these are the UTM zones of the world. Um, each one is six degrees of longitude, um, numbered kind of from um, zero to, to 60. Um, and this is what it would look like if I were to take one zone and try to project the entire world from that zone. So knowing your zone number is really, really important so you can, you can make sure that it's accurate. Um, in this case, this is, this is the zone that Indiana is in, 16 north. Um, and you can see that you can't even, you can see the things nearby on either side, 15 and 17, fairly well. Um, but it begins to degrade in terms of accuracy as you get further and further away. Now again, Having a meter-based system is very, very useful um, for finding out distances um, as opposed to working with angular measurements. And there's one thing that's even a little bit more important about having a meter-based system. Um, and that comes in when we're dealing with raster data. Because if you remember from the second module, when we talked about raster data, we talked about the spatial resolution of the image. So the amount of the length in real-world coordinates along one side of a pixel. Well, because a degree of longitude varies as far as how many meters it is, how many kilometers it is with latitude. Um, what we end up having, having is if we have a raster data set where the default measurement is angular, those aren't going to be squares as you get further and further away from the equator. Um, so it's really important to have these things in a meter-based system. As far as just displaying them, modern computers can overcome a lot of this and display them fairly accurately. Um, but just as far as analysis goes, it's always, always better to have, because you're, you're limited to having square pixels in there, to have those square pixels defined as meters as opposed to degrees. So we talked about um, the two main factors in converting something on a sphere into something flat. Um, and the first of those was, was just that whole nature of doing that. Um, but then we also have problems with, of, of the impacts of local variation. And that comes in because the Earth is not a perfect sphere. Um, it's more like an ellipse, kind of a squished sphere. Um, but even then, it's, there, are, there are continents, there are rivers, there are mountains. There's all sorts of stuff that makes it so that it's not a perfect sphere. Um, so the actual geometric surface of the Earth is something we call the geoid. Um, and you can see that sort of exaggerated here um, in, in the fact that it's not even a perfect ellipsoid. Um, and because of this, we need a model for understanding what the surface of the Earth looks like. If we're dealing with surfaces, with, with angles off of the surface, you can imagine that it's going to be quite different whether we're further out on the top of a mountain or whether we're down in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So we have to have an understanding of what the surface is like. Um, and the models of these, um, the best ones w is something mathematical so it doesn't have to store the elevation of every point on the Earth um, and has it smoothed out to, to be about 100 meters or so of accuracy. We call these datums. And I apologize for any Latin scholars watching this. The plural that we use here for the datum is actually datums. Um, data would sound a little silly in this context. So a datum is um, a reference surface for the Earth, defining the size, the shape, um, the origin, orientation of, of the coordinate systems that are being used. So different datums are better for different areas. Um, some are better for North America. Some are better for Europe. Some are better for the entire world. Um, but it's important to remember that these are the basis for a coordinate system. This is how the coordinate system is defined, is based on the datum. These are three of the most common ones up here um, that, that we, we will run into throughout the course of, of these modules um, and probably further in your GIS career. Um, there are two up here that are listed for North America, the NAD27 and the NAD83. They're very good for, for Canada, North America, and Central America. Um, they're not quite as good for the rest of the world. Um, 
so the one where we use most commonly that's that's accurate for pretty much everywhere is this WGS84 datum. Um, and this is overwhelmingly the most commonly used. Um, so the way that they w that it would work is if you were scanning a map, it would be written on there. If you download data, it's going to be part of the file what the datum is that it's using. Now I want to stress here that projections and datums are linked. Um, the datum kind of forms the reference for the projection. So if you're dealing with a projection, you're not just going to see Lambert conformal or UTM zone 16. You're going to see WGS 1984 Lambert conformal, WGS 1984 UTM zone 16 north. Um, so they're linked together and it's very hard to, um, to, to separate them out. In fact, if you take a map and put the wrong projection on it, you're going to end up having um, quite a lot of different uh, of errors between how it should look and, and how it actually does look. So it's really important to know that you're dealing with the right reference, the right datum, the right projection, um, and the right coordinate system. Now I want to talk a little bit about the process of what we call georeferencing maps and imagery. Um, and this is how we would take something that we'd scanned, a paper map, an aerial photograph, something that had no coordinates with it, and defining both the projection the coordinate system, the datum, and then flattening it out in a way that we can begin to use it in GIS analysis. Now, there are two different sort of systems here, um, georeferencing and rectification, and they're both kind of designed to, be, to making an image fit the, fit the world. So we're changing the geometry, changing any distortion that's in there from sort of camera angles, um, from the curvature of the earth, um, really from, from a bad scan even. Um, and there are two systems that we, that we might use, two definitions. Um, if we're registering an image, it means it's already been projected. Um, so it's a scanned map, something like that. And we're just assigning coordinates to the pixels. We're saying this corner is this location, this corner is this location, make everything else fit in there. Um, and then the concept of georeferencing is where we're actually doing both this and we're making it conform to a map projection. So we're taking something that's a picture um, or an image of, a, of the spherical surface and both assigning coordinates to pixels and flattening it out in some way, projecting it in some way. So these are two different things technically. Colloquially in the GIS world, we refer to almost both, both of them pretty much always as georeferencing. So if you hear me say georeferencing, it may be registration, it may be formal georeferencing, but it's really usually just called the same thing. Now how we do this is we have, to know, we have to have known points. We have to have what we call GCPs or ground control points. And these are physical features with a known location. This could mean that it's a location that I know the XY coordinates for, I know the latitude and longitude for. It could mean that it's a coordinate that I can find between two different images. Um, I just have to, it could be that the coordinates are printed on the map itself. Um, I just have to have a known location to be able to tell the computer, to, to tell the software where that place is. Now once I've done this a few times, once I have a few points on there, I can begin to, to actually start georeferencing the image. Um, and I do this by using some sort of transformation system, um, by using some sort of polynormal transformation to, cr transformation to create a mathematical relationship between the location in space, in the real world, and each of the pixels in that image. So spots in the image and the coordinate system itself. So there are different methods that will allow us to overcome different types of distortions in the original image. But most often, um, and in the case of the, the demonstration for this module, we're going to work with the affine um, system, or a first, or, first order polynomial, um, which is essentially a linear relationship between the original image um, and the, the space in the real world. Um, so essentially what, what we end up with is we're, we're taking um, or we're creating a mathematical relationship, a line um, that explains the difference between the x-coordinate on the image, so the number of pixels in along the x-axis on the image, and the x-coordinate in space. Um, and then doing the same thing for the y-coordinate. So we need three different points to be able to do this. Um, anything after that is going to either improve our model or give us an understanding of the error. Um, and this will allow us to do things like change the size, um, change the orientation, skew it a little bit, um, and really kind of begin to, to, to warp the image to fit the real world coordinates. Um, there are also higher order transformations we can do, second and third order poly polynomial um, uh, transformations. They, they don't assume a linear relationship. They may assume as kind of a curvilinear, curvilinear relationship. 
um, where we end up with um, having a lot, needing a lot more control points to be able to explain that relationship. And these will allow us to do things like overcome any really systematic warp. If we had a fisheye lens, if there was curvature of the earth, if the angle of the photograph was taken at kind of an oblique angle as opposed to being straight down. Um, these are things that we can overcome with these higher order transformations. Now it's always important when you're doing this to understand how good of a job you've done. So we always want to, to get some measure of the error um, associated with the, the linear relationship, with the model that we've created to transform that image. Um, and this is usually measured as the deviation from a few extra ground control points from the curve that's been generated based on the first three or the first nine or something like that. Um, the system that ArcGIS uses that we'll work with in the demonstration is the root mean squares or RMS error. Um, and again, this is essentially the deviation from the actual um, linear relationship that we've sort of created from our model. So this is a little bit of an overview of the concept of projections. Um, how we might be able to take a spherical surface and flatten it out onto a map, um, and then how we would actually do the process of scanning something or taking an aerial photograph um, and actually making it conform to the real world. Now in the future, um, the following uh, modules, we're going to focus a little bit more on specific topics, um, first off related to um, satellite imagery, um, and then, then working a little bit with um, uh, creating vector data.